Perfect. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Hi, I'm Arthi Ramachandran. I'm a PhD candidate at Concordia University studying how bacteria are changing in the Arctic Ocean with climate change. So I'm extremely excited for the next event, um, which is called Multiple Threats to Polar Oceans, um, organized by Plymouth Marine Laboratory. And so I'm happy to um, introduce our moderator, David Shookman, um, who will be moderating this event. So welcome, everyone. Um, both in this room and virtually. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, just to be completely clear, I'm not a scientist, uh, but I've been a science journalist for many, many years. And I worked for the BBC as a correspondent, doing lots of different jobs. But for the last 20, I focused on environment and science. And early on in that role, I realized that I was quite cynical about what environmental campaigners were saying about the Arctic and the polar bears and all the rest of it. Like a lot of journalists, I don't like to be told what to think. So with the support of editors, I organized trips to visit researchers in the field, especially in the Arctic, but also in the Antarctic, the Amazon, Siberia, the Kalahari Desert, to understand what the teams in the field were really finding out, what they could say with confidence, what they could not say with confidence. And it was partly selfish. It was for me to understand what was really happening to the planet so that I was getting the best possible evidence that I could then relay to the huge audiences of the BBC. Because if you think back 20 years, there was a lot of denial, and there was a lot of skepticism, and a lot of like, what's this got to do with me? So I saw my role as a kind of educator to try and inform as many people as possible about what was happening. And you know, I've got to confess that when I started these journeys, quite early on, it was like being slapped in the face. Like, do you get it now? And then I'd go to another location, talk to the scientists, and then it would be like another slap in the face. Do you get it now? That we are doing, as a race, a human species, a really brilliant job of trashing the planet. And we're also trashing the few things in the natural world that are our allies in the fight against climate change. So it's, it's always struck me that one of the most important indicators, because there was always the cliche about the Arctic being the canary in the climate change coal mine. Actually, that's true. And I was always told in the early days, talking to scientists, that the Arctic was warming twice as fast as the global average. I'll be corrected by all the scientists here. It's faster than that. And the effects on the ice, the breakup, the melting, the effect on the land ice, the sea ice, is actually, my reading of it is that it's faster than many, than many people suggested it might be 10, 20 years ago. So we're, we're really dealing with an alarming problem. And particularly, I'm gonna outcompete that guy. I've got a really loud voice. I don't care who he is. So. Um, what really struck me is combining reporting on the polar ice with reporting on the effects on coastal communities, whether it's in the Arctic or in Bangladesh 
many other parts of the world and realizing some cities, some countries can afford to be better protected. I mean, London, where I live, has the beautiful, huge steel Thames barrier. But I've been to villages in Bangladesh where there's no steel, there's no barrier, there's nothing. There's maybe some mud. So the polar challenge to me is fascinating in a science sense, hugely important in a social sense, and profoundly important in the sense of a key debate here, which is equity and fairness in climate change and our response to it. So, as you can tell, I'm an obsessive about the polar regions. I was very pleased when I was invited to do this. Actually, my job is not just to keep talking, although I could for hours about this, um, but to introduce proper scientists who actually know things and are, are finding things out. And I'm a huge fan of, of their work because if it wasn't for the scientists doing the work, whether it's studying satellite pictures at home or at base or digging snow holes and trekking across the ice and putting up with terrible conditions, we wouldn't be here. I mean, these cops would not happen without the role of, of scientists and especially polar scientists. Um, let's go to our first speaker, Michael Meredith from the British Antarctic Survey. I've been given a long biography, but he's an oceanographer, a science leader at uh, British Antarctic Survey. And uh, Michael was a coordinating lead author uh, for the IPCC, which is again, what the politicians either read or should read. If they don't read it, I'll try and tell them what it says. Michael. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much, and it's brilliant to have David here and give th this insight and introduction from the world of media and rely on um, his experience to contextualize what we're talking about today. I can guarantee I'm equally obsessive as David. I can't guarantee my voice is as loud as his, so at some point we may get drowned out. So bear with me, um, and I'll do my best anyway. I'm going to give a talk about the polar oceans and some aspects of how threatened they are, how they connect to the rest of the world, and why that matters. I thought I'd start by showing you this map. And if you know me, you'll know that this is my favorite projection of planet Earth. It's different from conventional maps in that this is kind of the fish's eye view of how the world really is. It's not the continent surrounded by ocean, which is how you normally see it. It's the ocean surrounded by the continents. And when you look at it in this form, you realize there is only one ocean. All the ocean basins connect, but there is only one ocean. However, all the oceans aren't the same, and different oceans matter in different contexts. If you draw a schematic of ocean circulation on top of this projection, which is what I've done here, you can see how important the Southern Ocean around Antarctica is. This is the basin that connects the Atlantic the Pacific and in the Indian Oceans, and it's where a lot of the key transformations of different waters happen that then go on to feed the overturning circulation across the globe. You can also see the Arctic. It looks small by comparison, but just look at the changes in the colors of the arrows there. And that's really indicative of key changes that happen in the Arctic. The changes that happen there feed the headwaters of the circulation in the Atlantic and they exert a really strong influence on global climate. How is this influence affected? Well, this overturning circulation draws down a huge amount of heat from the atmosphere, and it draws down a huge amount of carbon from the atmosphere. And by doing that, by taking this heat and this carbon out of the climate system and storing it in the ocean for centuries or potentially longer, it slows the rate of climate change in the different parts of the climate system. How much is that? Well, you can do calculations and you can figure out the different roles of the different ocean basins on drawing down heat, drawing down carbon, 
if you look at the pie charts here, they're very garbled, unfortunately. I don't know why. But the green is the Southern Ocean and the blue is the Arctic. And if you add up the Southern Ocean and the Arctic, they're responsible for more than three quarters of the heat that's drawn down from the atmosphere and about half of the carbon that's drawn down from the atmosphere. So they exert very strong, disproportionately critical effects on our climate. Now you can do a calculation. If you're interested in money, you can try and think about, well, what's that equivalent to in pounds or dollars or whatever your currency might be? So just for fun, I did a calculation. This is using UK government figures for how much carbon credits are worth. And the Southern Ocean, just by itself, is responsible for a carbon sink that's equivalent to about $68 billion per year. Error bars are huge, but I think anyone would agree that is a vast number. That's not money we can take and spend, unfortunately, but it's money we would have to find from somewhere if we wanted to buy those carbon credits from a different source. So the Southern Ocean, the polar oceans, are doing us a huge climate favor. And this is an indicative figure for how much some of that is worth. This favor comes at a cost. We don't get it for free. This cost is ocean warming. This cost is the oceans getting more acidic. This cost is ocean losing oxygen. This cost is the destruction of habitat and destruction of ecosystems and biodiversity. And you'll hear much more about each of these throughout the rest of this session. One of the costs relates to the loss of ice. The plot on the left here is from the IPCC report in 2019, and it shows the loss of ice in the Arctic. The area where you see brown, that's where the sea ice has been retreating very rapidly. It's emblematic, it's an icon of climate change globally. It's driven by rising ocean temperatures, rising atmospheric temperatures, and it's happening now. You'll see down the end of the room here, the pillar that's toppled, that is Arctic sea ice, and it presages the loss of summer sea ice in the Arctic at least once by 2050. It's happening now. Antarctic sea ice seems to be quite resilient by comparison. The plot on the right here is a time series of ice extent in the Antarctic. And you can see for many years, it seemed to be holding its own. And we were puzzled by that and intrigued how Antarctic sea ice could buck the climate trend. But then you'll see in recent years, climate change has caught up with the Antarctic. And sea ice around the Antarctic has dropped to record low levels and has stayed low. So unfortunately, the message from the Antarctic is now no better than it is from the Arctic. There's other loss of ice. This again is from a recent IPCC report and it shows sea level rise projections out to the end of this century. The colored lines show the likely range and it's between half a meter and a meter of sea level rise by the end of this century, depending on which emission scenarios we choose to take. The choice is with us now. There's also the dash line, which is the really scary line. The configuration of the Antarctic ice sheet is such that it's incredibly vulnerable to warming oceans. When that warmer water can penetrate beneath the ice sheet, it can trigger feedbacks and tipping points that then accelerate upon themselves, and you can get runaway melting and sea level rise. We don't know how likely that is, but it's plausible. And if it does happen, sea level rise will be much more rapid than it would be otherwise. It's a very scary prospect. There was some work done just recently to try and put some numbers on the cost of sea level rise purely from the melting of Antarctic ice. The best case scenario, this is with optimal adaptation and the best choice about emissions that we can make from here. The best case scenario is more than $60 billion per year by the end of this century, which is a big number. The worst case scenario, if we get adaptation wrong, it could be more than a trillion dollars per year, which is a phenomenal number. Finding that money globally is huge. That's in, the, that's in the domain of these colored lines. The dashed line, the one that's really scary and really hard to predict, almost impossible to put a number on that. And the authors were, 
were very honest about that. But that worst case scenario could be many times greater. It could be many trillions per year. So how does that matter beyond uh, the polls in other ways? The plot on the right hand side here is the one I showed at the start. It shows how connected the polar regions are to the rest of the world via ocean circulation. And if you the polar region, I put large amounts of fresh water in, you can disrupt these currents. You can pass tipping points. And the plot on the left here shows the tipping points that you can see with the disintegration of West Antarctica, the disintegration of Greenland, and the effects it can have down the whole length of the Atlantic and around the rest of the world. We're already seeing some changes happening. We're seeing dense water export from Antarctica drying up. It's diminishing over time. We're seeing other changes happening. We are at the cusp of these tipping points. It's unlikely to shut down completely, but already there are signs it may be slowing and the projections say that will continue. So the final slide, the take home messages, the things I would really like you to walk away in your head. Ocean circulation connects the whole planet and it's fundamental to our climate and the future of our climate. And the polar regions are really, really critical to the stability and the future of that circulation. The polar regions themselves are very, very vulnerable to change. We know that, and that's hugely important. The rest of the world will feel those effects of polar change when they're diminished. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Michael, Michael, thank you very much indeed. And I do remember on that scenario graph, the one that has the low likelihood but high impact dotted line, a big debate actually that I had with colleagues in the BBC newsroom about how do we phrase that? Because over many, many years, the tendency among scientists had been caution. And uh, I'd sensed that within the community, there'd been a debate for quite a while about, well, actually, these more outlandish scenarios are not impossible. And it was very, very striking. I thought in the publication of the IPCC that actually your peers and all the reviewers accepted the idea that there ought to be a wild dashed line to flag up the risks uh, of things being way, way worse. So thank you very much for that. Um, I've got a vested interest in thanking our next speaker because she invited me to this session. Helen Findlay from the Plymouth Marine Laboratory, who is an oceanographer, uh, a focus on acidification, if I've got that right, which we've had a little nod to from Michael. Helen, all, all yours. Great. It's great. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for allowing us to come here and talk to you about the multiple threats that our polar oceans are facing today. So I'm going to be talking to you about um, ocean acidification, as uh, David just mentioned. So uh, what I'd like to do, I think I've done that twice, is just make sure we're all on the same page here, understanding what ocean acidification is. So the carbons, as we've heard from Mike, um, the oceans take up carbon from the atmosphere, and they do this as a favor to us. Um, in the respect that they're able to take that carbon away and they're taking it into the deep ocean and locking that carbon away. And that's allowed the oceans to take up a lot of extra um, heat from the atmosphere as well and prevent acid, um, the temperature warming in the atmosphere being um, even more worse than it could have been if that carbon had been locked away. So about 25% of the um, CO2 that's been emitted into the atmosphere has been taken up by the oceans. The problem is that we're doing it so quickly now that the oceans aren't able to catch up and keep up with that natural um, uptake. And that's resulting in a change in the marine carbonate system such that we're acidifying the oceans. The, the pH is decreasing, resulting in more acidic oceans. And importantly as well is we're reducing the amount of carbonate ion uh, in the oceans. And this relates to um, biological organisms that produce calcium carbonate shells. Anything that are like a coral or a, a clam or a mussel that has these calcium carbonate shells. Um, this is really important for them because in under, what we call undersaturated conditions, when um, the conditions go below what we call one, um, that water becomes essentially corrosive to those organisms. And I just point that out here because there'll be a couple of graphs where you'll see saturation state and I'll just point out where it gets towards one. 
So what do we know? We know that the Arctic Ocean is acidifying. We have that data now for the past 30 or more years that's showing that ocean acidification is happening in the real world. It's out there. It's not just model projections. Um, we have the data to back up the story. This is some recent work from this year which highlights that the Western Arctic um, is one of the most rapidly changing places in terms of acidification we think now on the planet for the data that we have available. Um, it's acidifying in certain water masses, so you get it's quite a complex region, you've got different water flows coming in, it's quite shallow, um, lots of different activities going on there, but up to three to four times faster here than we've observed in other regions around the world. And that's quite a worrying figure. And just as a sort of, don't worry too much about the detail, but this is, um, if you go, you've got time on the x-axis and the pH in this first graphs, aragonite saturation state in the second graphs, and you can see that declining trend in pH and declining trend in the saturation state, such that some of these water masses are actually already at level of one, that chemical threshold of, of corrosivity, and others are actually getting there, they will be there in the next 20, 30 years. We also know this is happening in the Southern Ocean. So it's not just an Arctic Ocean issue, it's a Southern Ocean issue. And we have similar sorts of rates um, that we're experiencing in the Southern Ocean. There's data now that as you go from the, this is an example for going from Australia down to the Antarctic Peninsula, but as you go from the sort of subtropical regions down through the polar fronts to the polar zones, actually you get more rapid acidification in those polar waters. And so that amplification of the cold waters taking up more carbon, fresh water, um, preventing the oceans from buffering that change um, is having a big impact. And you've got the same sort of thing here. You've got the first line of graphs is uh, the CO2 concentration increasing. The second line of graphs is the pH decreasing. Um, and the third line of graphs there is the aragonite saturation, that corrosivity of the water as it reaches one. Um, you can see, especially in the polar regions, that bottom graph there. Um, we know that this is happening, what, what about in the future? So we also know that the oceans have a long memory. It takes a long time for anything that's going on in the oceans to get back to the states that it was before. And these, uh, the work shows that future modeling is not just limited to the 2100. And I think we need to be clear about that, not only for acidification, but the sea ice loss, the sea level rise, all of these multiple factors are going to go on beyond the year 2100. So if we were to stop, I think this, this blue line represents, if we'd stopped emitting carbon in the year 2000, we still wouldn't be reaching the same pH levels by the year 2500. If we keep on emitting to the year 2100 in these two different scenarios, we've got models here, again, the pH is taking a long time to rebound back up. It's just not going to get back to pre-industrial levels without sucking out that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and taking it back out of the ocean, allowing those natural processes to cap keep up and keep pace. So why does that matter? Well, it matters for marine organisms like um, people. We have to maintain our internal acid base physiology. We have to keep our pH levels uh, very stable. All organisms have to do that as well. And we're actually now got evidence that in the oceans today, in certain regions where acidity is already relatively low, we're seeing impacts to marine organisms. So these are some pteropods, um, which are small, uh, snails, free swimming snails, and their important fish um, food, food for fish like salmon. They're already showing um, in some places dissolution of their shells. So where they're in that corrosive water, that corrosive water is starting to dissolve them away. We're seeing the same sort of thing happen to larval crab. Um, so they're actually got some shell dissolution, but also they're affecting the way their mechanoreceptors work. So the way they're able to detect their environment and, and feel their environment. And then we're also seeing things like in the Southern Ocean, a lot of calcification from small phytoplankton, calcifying phytoplankton, which are important for um, the base of the food chain. So we know it's happening now, and we know that the biological impacts are starting to appear as we see this pH declining go further. So what does this mean? We've got a lot of lab studies um, now that we, we can predict in the lab what's going to happen. Um, so just to take you through kind of what that means from an individual point of view to the food web, We've got Southern Ocean and, and Arctic food webs, and we know that there's going to be changes in that primary production, that first order uh, level of the food web. And there may be elements in the polar oceans where we think actually there will be increased primary production, increased photosynthesis, because we've got increasing light, loss of ice, changes in nutrient regimes. But actually acidification may shift that balance uh, most likely to smaller size uh, species, and that can have an impact again 
feeding up through the food chain for the amount of food available for fish um, higher trophic levels. Key changes in secondary consumers, so things that we know that copepods, for example, are incredibly important in these food webs, and there's evidence to show that those are going to be impacted either directly or through this nutrient change budget. Changes in the size of the organisms can change the nutrient stations and the amount of um, carb like nutrients passed up the food web. And that leads to either direct impacts on the fisheries that we're concerned about, um, both the clams and the, the benthic aquaculture shell fisheries, but also the commercial fisheries species, predator-prey interactions, things like that, are likely to be impacted. So our, our stages of, of science at the moment are really trying to understand how these food web dynamics are going to change and also what that means for society more generally um, and how we can kind of predict these kind of impacts. So we don't yet know exactly what it's going to look like, but we know it's going to change and it's going to look different to how it is today. Acting now can prevent the worst. And I just highlight here that these two figures from the IPCC uh, special report on the ocean and climate change. The top panel represents the future oceans uh, in red, represents these corrosive waters. So anywhere there will be undersaturated, so corrosive to these calcium carbonate minerals, um, all year round. So you can see that in these high emission scenarios, um, most of the Southern Ocean, most of the Arctic Ocean, some of even encroaching down into the North Atlantic is going to be year round by the end of the century corrosive to these um, kinds of organisms. If we can stick to the Paris World Agreement levels, um, these low emission scenarios, then it's a much starker, better picture that we see. This is why it's important to be acting now and it's just going to be limited to certain areas of the Arctic Ocean and some seasonal um, undersaturated conditions. I'm going to end on this one and just to say that acting now is also important locally. So this is a global problem, but locally we can also do things to help reduce the ocean acidification impact. And we're working together with people like the Ocean Acidification Alliance to really get together with governments and scientists, bring those people together to understand what it is we can do, not only to reduce them and mitigate the causes, so importantly, reducing emissions, but we need to be thinking about how we can um, implement uh, other solutions to help with that um, alongside those emissions, but also assess the local vulnerabilities. What is it that our co-stressors, how are these multiple factors um, affecting ocean acidification? Can we manage those systems a little bit more? Can we reduce river runoff? Can we reduce local pollution? Can we save habitats? Working with science and networks, looking at new technologies to help monitor and um, recognize that we can't all be observing everywhere at the same time, but we, we can think about remote technologies to help fill in some of those gaps, so investing in science and capacity development. And thinking about building adaptation, um, we need to be thinking about climate smart marine spatial planning, we need to be thinking about how we can actually be looking at where these changes are going to be happening fastest and more vulnerable species are living and how we can take that into account when we're planning um, where we're, we're going to be putting our agricultural systems or putting anything else. Um, and finally, educating the public and stakeholders, which is why we're here today. And I'm going to end on that note. Thank you very much. Helen, thank you. And I, I think although, I mean, I knew about acidification and uh, I'm sure everybody here did, Bash, it's really striking. I'd never seen those images of the corrosion that's already happening in the shells of these little organisms. And... I'm just kind of thinking now about public messaging that they need to be more widely circulated and maybe we could talk about that afterwards. But I mean, I think, because for a long time, ocean acidification was a kind of slightly theoretical future problem, uh, but actually if you can just see it happening, it's pretty in your face and, and mind blowing. So thank you for that. Um, next speaker, Robbie Mallett, um, who, who has been studying satellite pictures to study the sea ice in the Arctic and the Antarctic. But just in case you thought he was a kind of desk chappy sitting in the central heating, he's about to go to West Antarctica for the winter, the Antarctic winter. I guess you're just soaking up a little bit of charm sunshine before you go. All right, over to you. Hi everyone, thanks for having me and, and I'll just veer out of my lane slightly for a second to say that ocean acidification, I, I think 
so much about the change in uh, in organisms behavior from ocean acidification that's probably uh, the big thing that actually keeps me up at night rather than uh satellites and such but i will talk oh yeah but i oh there we go but i will talk about sea ice now um so i'll, I'll just summarize oh, i'm gonna give some help here my incompetence Thanks. So I just want to give a give a, a crossing a crossing the T overview, as, as others have, have drilled down into their specific uh, disciplines about what's happening in the Arctic, because the Arctic is the ocean of change for me. It is the fastest changing ocean on the, on Earth, and we also can't see it for a lot of reasons. So it's at the top of the map that we traditionally project. Mike's trying to resolve that, uh, but we also can't see it from space as well as we can see a lot of the other oceans just because of the orbits of the satellites that we that we launch. So I think the Arctic is really important, but it's also really underrepresented in terms of how we think about global change, which is why I'm really pleased to be here. So this is a graph, this is hot off the press. I did this last week, uh, about three days ago, of, of the global uh, temperature anomaly. So how is the global temperature changing if you just average everywhere on Earth? Uh, and you can see that in a blue line, clearly trending up, very consistently trending up. Uh, but if we put the Arctic Ocean on top of that, it's really, really stark. So that is a, a massive amplification, and that's the, the technical word that we use. It's, it's amplified warming. And this graph here is it's probably the best data we have. It's from the big European uh, modeling center. It's 3.6 is the factor. That's the big number on this plot. 3.6 or 360% or if you want. Uh, times the global mean rate of warming. So we really need to sit up and, and take notice of the Arctic because it is really shocking what's going on. And it's not rocket science. You, you don't need a rocket science. You, you don't need a climate scientist, in fact, to tell you what's going to happen if we crank the temperature dial up in the Arctic. We're going to see the sea ice go away. We're going to see the frozen thin cap on the surface of the Arctic Ocean. It just diminishes. So it diminishes in its area. It contracts towards basically the North Pole, where it's coldest, uh, but it also thins. And that's, uh, that's actually the work that I do. I try and establish how quickly it's thinning and, and where it's thinning, because thinning of the sea ice is it's really important because thinning is the precursor of, of retreat. So before the Arctic sea ice runs away and, and, and hides in the central Arctic, it thins. So this, this is an example as a map, a bit easier to understand than a line graph of, of what's going on. So, uh, this is how we started on the left. Uh, as soon as we got these satellites up and developed continuous observations of the Arctic, uh, of the area of the, the sea ice in 1979, we had really good coverage. And this is the minimum extent. So every year, the sea ice shrinks back at the end of the summer to a, a minimum uh, safe place, uh, you, you might see it as. Um, and, and that covered large sections. Critically, it, it the ice edge was a, was a lot shorter, actually. It went right up to the coast in many areas, uh, and, and that was a very stable position for it. But now, if you look on the right, it's retreated right into the central Arctic. That purple splodge is, is where we are now. And you can see that on the Russian side in the top right, uh, it's, it's just open water in the summer this year. So the September minimum, we had vast sections of just open ocean, and that, that's shocking. And this is the worst, well, it's, it's, it's the worst case that we've seen so far. This, this is the record low where sea ice retreated towards the North Pole in, in 2012, related to a few storms that made their way up towards the North Pole. And if you're a, an LNG tanker, or if you're trading between China and Europe, or if you're interested in perhaps extracting the resources from those shallow self, shelf seas on the right-hand side of the map uh, near Russia, you're really interested in that because that sea ice retreat that's a highway for you in the summer. So as well as these geophysical and biological hazards, we also need to think of new human threats to the polar oceans that are happening because the sea ice is retreating. And th this, is, this is in fact what we work on. So this, this black dashed line is called the Northeast Passage. So that's the route that you take uh, quite often if you're interested in shipping cars between Korea and the UK, for instance. Uh, and it will cut your fuel costs, uh, sorry, it will cut your total costs in half, in fact. Um, it's really effective because you can save fuel, it's a shorter route, but it's also much quicker in time. So you save on staffing costs, you save on insurance costs. It's just way cheaper to ship this route. Um, and, and as well as doing that in summer, this is, this is the winter, this is the February mean sea ice thickness. 
So you're starting to be able to bust through that ice in February now with an icebreaker. So as well as the, re the retreat in the summer leaving open water, we're seeing breakably thin ice in the Arctic in February, uh, which is, as well as those environmental hazards, it's also issues of governance, uh, it's, it's geopolitical threats to the Arctic, because you're right in the Russian economic exclusive zone there. You're right in Russian controlled waters. So there's a real emerging uh, issue of governance that we need to address. And, and Mike showed this plot earlier on the left, but the, the Antarctic is now looking shaky. So we used to say, oh, and Antarctic sea ice, uh, the, the trend in the minimum sea ice extent in Antarctica is actually increasing, um, which, which was sort of true. It wasn't a statistically significant trend, but certainly if you just drew a line through the, the points, it was increasing. But in the last sort of five years, we've seen a truly shocking drop off in the, in the minimum of extent of Antarctic sea ice and, and I was actually I was actually down there for this last bottom right point uh, in, in, in February March this year uh, and it just felt like we were we were sailing and we were sailing in a part of Antarctica called the Weddell Sea and uh, we were all just sort of in a state of, of shock like something huge was was about to happen and, and uh, it, was, it was quite emotional really and this is on the right hot off the press three, three days ago we're still tracking at the lowest observed Antarctic sea ice extent on record. So since this record began in 1979, uh, you can see every the evolution of the sea ice extent every year in the gray lines. We're currently on the red line on that trajectory this year, the lowest on record uh, for the day. So it's worth considering where we can go now, now that we've reached this uh, critical uh, and devastating point. Um, we do still have a choice, particularly for the Arctic, because just as the Arctic responds quickly to our emissions, it's arguably the fastest responding system on Earth to our emissions, uh, it'll respond to us stopping those emissions. It'll respond to us mitigating climate change. So on the right, you've got the jargonistic uh, shared socioeconomic pathways that the IPCC talks in. But broadly speaking, we have the, the lowest emission scenario at the top and the highest emission scenario at the bottom. And I just want to share a, an insider tip uh, in interpreting this graph. You, you might remember uh, I plotted a linear line on the right, just a straight line. And you might say, hey, why is it, why is it straight here? Why, why is the decline that we've seen linear, straight line? But then these model projections are curved. And, and that's actually because a lot of the IPCC models, they just hit zero really quickly. So if, if the model is hitting zero around 2050, your average a bunch of zeros you start to curve out but that's actually quite misleading that it looks like we're gonna we're gonna sort of taper off and even under a high emission scenario we'll be left with some sea ice that's not the case so we have models consistently hitting zeros dragging the, dragging the average down and, and that's kind of almost an artifact of this IPCC plot so don't be fooled um, this is the this is the hope message this is where we can go so the Arctic sea ice it responds very directly to our emissions in summer and therefore, because it responds so directly, we've not committed to losing Arctic sea ice, okay? It is still geophysically possible to hold onto Arctic sea ice through 2050. The issue is that we're not, okay? The scenarios for emissions that we talk in terms of, those are committed emissions, and those bring the committed warming, okay? There is no intrinsic committed sea ice loss uh, in the system. If we stopped emitting today, we would halt summer sea ice loss. And the, the, the result of that is also it is reversible. So if we choose to remove the emissions from the atmosphere, if we back away from the edge and don't just stand there at two degrees, we can actually rejuvenate summer sea ice. We can, we can backtrack, we can reverse our mistakes if you view them that way. Um, and we can save the day in the Arctic. So uh, that's all I have to say. I think I'm gonna hand over to David. Thank you very much. Very good. And it is, a, I'm going to reduce the height of these microphones after our last speaker. There we go. Now you can hear me again at our competition with next door. But that was amazing. And um, for a very long time, whenever I did stories about the Arctic sea ice or about Greenland and the state of its ice, I would get pretty angry, quite often hostile climate deniers and skeptics saying, yeah, but look at Antarctica. And for a very long time, the Antarctic sea ice was a puzzle, as you both suggested. Uh, and it wasn't an answer. I would ring up 
friendly scientists in desperation saying, how do I reply to this question? Is there global warming if only one chunk of ice is melting but not the other? Now, sadly, we're seeing that both are really motoring uh, in the wrong direction. So uh, that's, that's quite interesting for me to reflect on. Um, let's quickly move on to Sean Henley, our next speaker, University of Edinburgh. Uh, again, an incredibly long list of accomplishments and titles. I'm just going to hand over to you, Sean. Over to you. Thank you, David, for uh, not going through the exhaustive list and also for putting the microphones at the right height for me. There's no way I could have reached Robbie's heights. Uh, so, yeah, it's my great pleasure to be here today to talk to you about the impacts of all these changes that the other speakers have expertly introduced. We've got warming, we've got sea ice loss, we've got loss of Antarctic land-based ice, which is causing a freshening of the sea surface. And we've got ocean acidification, which Helen talked about. So what I'm going to do now is talk about the impacts of these changes on the Southern Ocean ecosystems. Uh, so I represent a, a big group of people working in the Southern Ocean, some of whom are here today. And uh, if you want to hear more about the Southern Ocean ecosystems and their plight, uh, please do come back here for six o'clock today, where we'll talk about that in more detail. But without further ado, on to uh, this presentation. So this is an image of a Southern Ocean ecosystem. You can see lots of different species of varying different sizes. They're linked together by arrows, which show what eats what and how different organisms interact with each other. And we've heard uh, already from the other speakers that these ecosystems are under enormous threat from warming of both the ocean and the atmosphere, of the loss of ice and the resultant freshening of the surface waters, and of ocean acidification. But what we really need to think about when we're considering the impacts on the ecosystem is not each of these um, threats individually, but is the way they come together and the way they combine and their cumulative effects on the Southern Ocean ecosystems. And these effects can be synergistic, they can act in the same direction, or they can be antagonistic, they can act against each other. But in the majority of cases for the Southern Ocean ecosystem, we're seeing that each of these individual threats uh, combine together to reinforce each other such that the cumulative effect of all of these threats is much greater than the sum of each of the individual threats. So I'm going to uh, talk through a few components of the ecosystem, some very important ones, and talk about how they are impacted by the changes underway. So firstly, the primary producers. These are the plants and the algae that take an incredibly important role in taking carbon out of the atmosphere and making it into marine life. By doing this, they also provide food for the entire ecosystem. But they are under a, a threat from increases in temperature, reductions in salt content or freshness, and ocean acidification. And these are each causing uh, changes in the composition of the species that we find there. And that might seem like a small detail, but actually it's incredibly important because the consumers in the system are very well adapted to their favorite food source, if you like. So as you change the composition of the primary producers, you change what can eat them and therefore you change the structure and the functioning of the entire ecosystem. And because this is being driven by species specific responses to temperature, ice loss and freshening and ocean acidification combined, we are seeing fundamental changes at the base of this food web. And that is driving changes throughout the entire food web and the important role that the Southern Ocean plays in the global system, as Mike explained to us earlier. Uh, so it's also worth thinking, not just in terms of the ecosystem itself, but the ecosystem services that the Southern Ocean provides and the critical societal benefit to human beings throughout the world. So these are 
uh, blue carbon and taking uh, and storing carbon in the oceans, as Mike described, and therefore helping us to mitigate climate change. Biodiversity in the Southern Ocean is critically important for supporting ecosystem health and productivity. Nutrient cycling within the Southern Ocean fundamentally underpins ocean health at the global scale and the productivity of our one global ocean. So these changes are coming together to impact not only what is happening around Antarctica and in the Southern Ocean, but at the global scale. If we go up a trophic level, we've, uh, a feeding level, we find Antarctic krill. This is the um, organism on Earth that represents the highest biomass of any organism, higher than the human race. So it is an incredibly important species in underpinning the entire Southern Ocean ecosystem. And it's also important for food security as uh, Antarctic krill fisheries become increasingly important as fish stocks elsewhere have been depleted over recent decades. And Antarctic krill is also suffering as a result of temperature changes, ice loss and freshening, and ocean acidification. We're seeing a shrinkage of krill populations towards the Antarctic continent as warming occurs and therefore warmer waters move further south and push the krill ahead of them. Krill are also very strongly adapted to Antarctic sea ice, which provides their refuge in their early life stages and their food source through the Antarctic winter. So as we lose that ice, we lose the reliability of the food source for krill and that has an impact on the krill population because it increases mortality and reduces survival. We also see the effects of ocean acidification on Antarctic krill, which is particularly pronounced in pregnant female krill. And this poses a critical challenge for reproduction of the entire species, and therefore the survival of that species in the medium and long term. And again, because of the uh, important role of this organism in the wider food web, the consequences of these multiple threats on Antarctic krill are felt by every organism that is reliant upon them, including the global human population. Building a little on what Helen told us earlier and these striking images of the effects of ocean acidification, this is the Antarctic pteropod. Li uh, Limacina helicina, which has been uh, photographed at the projected conditions of ocean chemistry for 2100 under a business as usual scenario. And we can see that time point zero here is when there hasn't been any effect of ocean acidification because this organism has been taken out of its habitat. The numbers are the number of days that the pteropod was exposed to this treatment. So we can see that in over the course of days, weeks, and just over a month, we really see the striking impacts of ocean acidification on the integrity of these shells, which defends these organisms and enable them to survive. We also see uh, problems with larval survival, because as well as these shells dissolving under acidic conditions, that also means that they can't grow under acidic conditions. And therefore, we don't have young pteropods becoming mature pteropods and ensuring the future survival of the species. And again, because this is a important zooplankton species, when we see changes in the Antarctic pteropods, this also has implications for the higher consumers and therefore the structure and functioning of the entire Antarctic ecosystem. And you can see I'm really hammering home this point about the changes in one component of the ecosystem having major implications throughout the ecosystem at the regional scale and at the Southern Ocean uh, scale as a whole, as well as throughout the global oceans.
It's a similar story in the seafloor ecosystems. These are particularly important in terms of taking up and storing carbon over longer periods of time. And again, we see the dissolution of the parts of these animals that are made of uh, calcium carbonate minerals, of which there is a disproportionate um, contribution in the seafloor ecosystems. But there are winners and losers. There are some species that will do okay as their tolerances are pushed. There are others that are not so flexible in their strategies and the conditions that they can handle. So they will lose, other species will win, and we'll see fundamental shifts in the composition of these critical ecosystems. So my final slide, we've uh, seen that there are these three threats directly related to climate change that we're all here to discuss, to work out how to mitigate, adapt to, and finance. But in addition to these and their effects on Southern Ocean ecosystems, which are cumulative, we also have the effects of direct uh, human activity within the Antarctic and Southern Ocean itself. So we're seeing a system that is of a lower resilience it is less able to cope with changes that are imposed upon it. And we're seeing rapid escalation of these climate change impacts. And this means that we are really delivering a very strong call for urgent protection at scale required to protect these ecosystems. And that needs to happen from two separate directions. It needs to happen at the local and regional level in terms of conservation and management to uh, increase the resilience of these systems and we need deep urgent cuts in greenhouse gas emissions to mitigate global climate change and I'll end there thank you there's only one word to say which is blimey <laughs> I mean you know for a long long time as a reporter, it was often quite hard to explain the relevance of the polar regions and polar change. Um, and uh, obviously, we're seeing that play out in so many different ways. But in terms of the food impact, the importance of fisheries, yeah, the, the, the rise of krill as a food source, uh, not just for marine organisms, but for us, uh, or at least for fish food and so forth. I mean, I think that's a really profoundly important uh, observation. So thank you very much for that. Um, What's often forgotten in discussions about polar change uh, is that, at least in the north, up at the roof of the world, there are thousands of people living there. Um, and very, very often, and you've seen this more broadly in discussions at, at COPs that I've been to over the years, that the voice of indigenous people in so many parts of the world is kind of drowned out, ignored, there may be a slightly tokenistic presence from the Pacific Island, but really the voice, the knowledge, the expertise, the culture, the history of indigenous people in so many parts of the world is not properly heard and not respected. So I'm really, really, really pleased to see that we have with us today uh, Lisa Kapolkwalak, forgive me if I got the pronunciation wrong, um, who is the uh, Vice President of International Affairs uh, for the ICC in Canada, a really leading role in the Inuit Circumpolar Council, um, to act as that voice. I might have muddled that all up, did he? Forgive me. But the ICC in Canada. Um, Lisa, it'll be great to hear your perspective about all this, what it actually means for the communities living in the polar north, because there's actually a long and terrible history of the treatment, if I may say, of your people at the hands of the colonial powers in all of the Arctic nations. And that's a continuing blight, I think, on the record of those countries. So it's a great honor to bring you to the podium. Thank you. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Is this okay? Oh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here and um, for those of you who uh, have heard about ice but have never seen it, um, I woke up uh, yesterday with photos on Facebook of my sister who lives in Pouvernitour, where I come from, where I was born, 
and who had gone uh, ice fishing. And she was showing this wonderful lake trout that she was going to bring home. She said, it was pretty cold out there, but uh, I was really happy to catch that fish. <laughs> so ice is real, it's solid, it can be on fresh water, it's on salt water, it can be our drinking water at home. When we go fetch uh, cuts of iceberg ice to use as drinking water, it's the best for tea, um, and uh, it's our highway. And our ancestors and many Inuit hunters still do hunt seals through the ice as they have uh, breathing holes and are adapted to Arctic living. And so our culture is so connected to the ice. It's one of the foundations of our Inuit culture where we built a whole language around it. As you know, there are many, many terms for snow and ice. There is soft snow, humid snow, wet snow, hard snow, snow that you can build igloos, houses with. There's all kinds of different types of snow that can be described in many, many forms. And I found it really outstanding now just to also listen to how the ocean is one ocean. And so... Um, I will go on to say that uh, we are all connected in this ocean. We Inuit and indigenous peoples worldwide have a direct and profound and spiritual relationship with our collective global oceans, coastal seas and the marine environment as a whole. We also have inherent rights to these regions and resources as affirmed in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and other international human rights instruments. When addressing oceans, we must remember that all of humanity is dependent upon the health and sustainability of the planet's oceans and coastal seas. The international legal order of oceans ranges from the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea to the International Maritime Organization Polar Code and numerous conventions, agreements and guidelines, including the Paris Agreement. All these are forums we are trying to bring the Inuit voice and message to. It's crucial to recognize and respect the right of Inuit and indigenous peoples to directly participate in these processes. There are, in, uh, sorry, and we see us ourselves being included in the dialogue on oceans and climate change from the Arctic Ocean uh, and to the uh, Antarctic Ocean. It's very important uh, for us as the oceans are all connected, so are we. As the world faces unprecedented challenges from climate change, pandemics, and human rights abuses, we are quick to see our differences rather than our similarities. And it's easy to support profit over sustainability. We are comfortable to surround ourselves with those who look and share similar histories and worldviews. However, if we wish to survive and evolve as a global community, we must create new paths forward, rethink our perspectives, and forge new partnerships. Be innovative, be resilient, be brave. We have a word, we have a special word that we've used for centuries. In some of our dialects, we say hakkaliak, going on top of the hill. In my dialect, we say nasitjok. We go up on top of a hill and look out beyond to observe the land, the weather, and the ocean. Hunters go nasitjok before they go out on a hunt, on an expedition. Sometimes expeditions can take days. Families go nasitjok before they moved camp or going to their cabins on these days. 
So it means to take time to observe such things as the direction of the wind, the movement of the tides, or the composition of the clouds, to observe change. And with this knowledge, we can determine the likelihood of a storm or the safety of the sea ice, and it helps us decide on the best route to travel and how to move forward. Indeed, observation is the foundation of planning, preparedness, and deliberate forward thinking. These are some of the strengths of our culture. We are constantly observing, especially now that change is happening rapidly and unpredictability in the world's climate and in the world's oceans can mean life or death. Stepping out of our daily routines and established perspectives means standing on top, atop a hill. Nasituk, to observe the global marine landscape and question our assumptions and viewpoints. When we look out across the Arctic Ocean, the oceans connect us rather than separate us. The oceans are the life of indigenous peoples worldwide and for Inuit. We live on the coast and on the sea ice. The ocean is central to our culture, our food security, our livelihoods. The Arctic Ocean and its ice connect Inuit amongst the four countries, but also to all other parts of the globe. The marine mammals, fish and birds that visit the Arctic through their life cycles and their global migrations sustain us and the Arctic Ocean provides the rich nurseries for many of the planet's biodiversity. The connection of the ocean to all aspects of human and biological life on this planet must be considered. We must nasik, we must chakhalir, the oceans from all perspectives, indigenous rights, sovereignty, biodiversity, climate, economics, resource development, shipping, militarization, research and knowledge acquisition, both Western and indigenous knowledge. These issues cannot be considered in isolation. The integrity and stability of ocean ecosystem dynamics are being seriously threatened by factors such as the loss of sea ice, ocean acidification, as we are learning, ocean warming, microplastics, coastal erosion, impacts to marine mammal habitat, including whale calving areas, and the subsequent impacts on food chains. Therefore, the existing international legal order concerning our legal rights and sovereignty in these realms, the international law, the biodiversity, the oceans, and the impacts of climate change requires direct recognition and respect for the intimate linkages between each of these dynamic elements of our planet. Our Inuit perspective, like human rights, suggests that, law, that all living beings, all relationships are interrelated. When one dimension is impacted, there's a domino effect upon ecological... I'm distracted by someone telling me I have one minute. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I'll finish in two minutes. <laughs> um, our perspective as Inuit are an integral facet of these relationships. The diversity includes the harvesting of marine mammals, fish, and vegetation that contribute to our food security. It also includes sustainable management and co-management of the marine environment and is related to food sovereignty. We have developed distinct indigenous knowledge over centuries based upon our observations and our dependence upon the marine environment. Hence, our indigenous knowledge is embedded in our language, cultures, values, and customs. And we view ourselves as a species among all other species of the oceans and coastal areas. I'd like to end that I'd like to end by saying that we Inuit have been creating new paradigms for marine conservation, approaches that are Inuit-led and built on our culture and economy. 
we are creating conservation economies through marine protection and, and conservation. There is a North Water Polinia that we call Piquela Soxoac, which is an example of how both Canada and Greenland are creating a marine conservation area, partnering with Inuit in co-managing this area and using indig indigenous knowledge to save this region from uh, the effects of shipping industry and of climate change and protecting marine wildlife, which we depend on for our food sovereignty. If we are to forge international consensus on the path forward towards conserving 30% of the global ocean by 2030, that respects UNDRIP and facilitates an all-in effort with industry, philanthropic foundations, youth, indigenous peoples, coastal communities, and NGOs, we have to understand we're all connected from the Arctic Ocean, whose krill feeds the great whales that travel the full longitudes of our planet, to the high Arctic, the nurseries of these great whales. What happens in one ocean impacts us all. Thank you for this opportunity. might be easier if I stay up here. Um, would that be the best thing? Lisa, please join. That way we can stay mic'd. You can share the mics there. I mean, what a, what a powerful testimony, Lisa. Thank you very, very much indeed for that. And I, I think what's really striking is, as I've observed in the world of science over some years, that there was a time when scientists kind of turned up in some part of the world, did their research, published it, and pushed off again without paying much attention to the people who lived there. And I think there's a much greater respect that I've detected in the research community, actually for the knowledge of indigenous people and their contributions, their observations, and actually their role in understanding and observing what's going on. So thank you very much indeed um, for that contribution. Um, what we really want to do in this final part of the session is take any questions um, that anybody has. And if you don't for the moment, I've got lots. Well, there's a question at the back. Now, are we going to be able to mic? Tell you what, do you want to come up? Can we get the mic there? Easier if you come up. That would be great. And just do say who you are and where you're from. Can we um, activate that microphone? Lovely. Okay. Didier Oyon, uh, I'm French and I'm coming from EDF company. I was a former power plant manager. I'm sorry, I'm not I, hearing. I will, I, will, I will try to, yeah. to, to speak up yeah. a little bit. You've got to compete so, with these guys over here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we have a lot of information and thank you for all these uh, informations about how the cryosphere is uh, behaving and so on. We have a lot of information also about the consequences and uh, the biosphere but not so much on the consequences on the human, I mean, um, what's going to be for us. And one of the, I, I guess, you already won the battle of um, uh, skepticism for, for climate. People understand that climate is changing. And climate is due to uh, behavior of human. But the consequences are not so clear when it comes to facts, uh, how it's going to affect uh, London, Paris, or whatever, our countries. Mm -hmm. We see uh, that we are extremely upside down by what happens in Ukraine, but not in Syria. So, you know, people need to understand really what's going on. And to tell you the truth, it's very difficult for me to find a reliable information about what are the consequences really next door. Okay, well, thank you very much for that question. And it does raise a really big challenge, which is how to communicate uncertainty in science. Because with the best will in the world and the best evidence and the supercomputers and the satellites and brilliant people working at it, you're never going to know for certain how things are going to pan out. Except that, as I think we've heard, whenever there is more melting, that water ends up in the ocean and uh, you do get an elevation of, of sea level. 
precisely how much and precisely how it affects different cities depends on the emission scenario. But why don't I ask Michael to come in on that? I mean, how, how would you advise our friend in terms of what it does mean for, let's say, a major European city? What are we likely to see over the next 50 years, 70 years? It's, um, it's an extremely good question, and thank you for raising it. Um, I think I'll say, first of all, that I, I admire your optimism that we've won the battle on the reality of climate change. I think most people here would accept that, but there are still some voices in the world who insist on denying the reality of climate change and the threats that it brings. So I don't think it would be sensible for us to presume that that battle is won everywhere yet. And we do need to keep making the point as often as we can to those voices to counter their disinformation. The point you raise about impacts on humans is extremely good. And this is really at the interface of natural science and social science of behaviorology. It's an incredibly complex field, but there's an awful lot of research is going on. Um, the resource I would point you to in the first instance is the one that I'm most familiar with, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. There's an expert from IPCC here as well who can perhaps say more if she chooses. Um, but they take the scientific information, the hard facts, the physical science, the chemical science, and then look at what are the impacts of those changes and what are the possible routes for dealing with those changes, the adaptations that might be possible, what are the challenges to those adaptations, what might be needed going forward. And that feeds into the dialogue that is happening here this week. And I'm hoping that people somewhere in the next building can hear this conversation because it's so critical that they take this seriously and, and action accordingly. We need far more information. The point you raise, the premise of your question is exactly correct, is that the uncertainties are very, very large. People behave in strange ways. Societies behave in strange ways. Knowing the future exactly is almost impossible. But what we can do is bracket the future and try and steer policy accordingly. Um, I showed some numbers in my presentation about equivalent financial costs, just to try and put a scale on the sorts of issues that we're dealing with. Um, not everyone is that concerned about money, but it really does, to me, bring home the magnitude um, of the issues that we're dealing with. Something that's in the trillions of dollars per year is a pretty significant part of global GDP. How on earth are we going to deal with that? How are we going to cover those costs? The money is not really the main point. The main point is the people and the environment. You know, where is our humanity? How do we find that? Where do we actually draw upon the societal drivers to do the right things going forward? So I think in terms of where you find the information, there are resources there. IPCC is a very good starting point. There are experts you can talk to here. Um, but I think I agree fully that more information is needed on that translation of information from hard science to behaviorology and then making the right policy decisions. I think that's probably a, a longer answer than the question you yeah. asked, so sorry for that. But, but, uh, but uh, th th Thanks, Michael. If I can just add to that, I think one of the problems which connects the two parts of your question is that sometimes you'll get from campaigners a kind of very exaggerated map showing how huge parts of the UK or Europe are just going to be underwater in... Well, the suggestion is that this might be immediate, you know, like in a matter of years. Or imagery showing Nelson's column in London underwater. Well, the problem I have with that is that it doesn't tally with the science. I mean, we know from the science that these processes, although rapid in geological terms, still are going to take to melt the entire Greenland ice sheet. You're talking centuries rather than decades. I mean, you might get a, a really profound impact quite s relatively soon. But I mean, I think when the imagery and the narrative is overly alarmist, it's very easy for people to say, well, that's all being exaggerated. So I always think, and Michael, I absolutely agree, to anchor any discussion in the IPC science, because that's gone through the mill. Peer review, endless checking, and by and large, if you anchor your discussions on that, that'll give you the right kind of answer. Um, 
I'm wondering whether, uh, Sean, you want to come in on this, because it's a communications challenge, apart from anything else, isn't it? How does one explain clearly that there is a problem, the sea is rising, but we're actually trying to work out exactly how much and by when? Thank you. Yeah, I think communicating to people who are not scientists is something that all scientists could be better at, uh, and it's a real priority amongst yeah. the community. So there is work underway there, and I think communicating our messages more clearly with tangible examples that people can get hold of is critical. So I've got an example on this. Mike said not everybody cares about money. I think everybody cares about food because it's fundamental to our survival. There are uh, three billion people in the world who are reliant on fish from the oceans as their primary food source. I referred in my presentation to the fact that the Southern Ocean underpins ocean health worldwide. What I meant by that is the export of nutrients from the Southern Ocean fuels productivity throughout the low latitudes and the mid latitudes of planet Earth. So by the ocean circulation system that Mike explained, the nutrients from the Southern Ocean are delivered to the coast of Africa, the coasts of North and South America, the coast of Asia, Europe, Oceania, all of the continents, and uh, all of those continents are reliant to some extent on fish resources from the ocean. I'll give uh, an Atlantic example because it's the one I'm most familiar with. The nutrients from the Southern Ocean that arrive at the surface ocean off the coast of Africa, the west coast of Africa and the east coast of the United States are fundamental food resources for the communities local to those regions but also for international commercial fisheries, which underpin food security worldwide. So by protecting mm. the systems in the Southern Ocean, we're protecting the, uh, the life support machine that that Southern Ocean provides to global human populations, both near and far. Great, thank you very much. And I'll just add a, a final thought, which is I mentioned the Thames barrier. I don't know how well you know London, but the, the Great Steel barrier that it's been used 200 times since it was built in the 80s, far more than predicted. And they're now planning a new, bigger barrier because they reckon because of sea level rise, because of all this process in the Arctic and the Antarctic, they'll need a new, bigger barrier by 2070. And talking to the engineers and people planning that, they kind of expect actually they're going to have to bring that forward. So the work has started to maybe get a new barrier ready by the early 2060s. It'll cost billions, but that's the kind of thinking that's being forced on people to adapt to a higher sea level. Thank you but for the question. There's a question, oh, you had a hand in the air. That's it, brilliant. Can we get a mic over here? I don't know if, it might be easier if you did make your way a bit forward. Great. It's like a sort of karaoke show, isn't it, really? But here we go. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Excellent uh, event. I've actually got a question, so I can't see Lisa. <laughs> um, could, could you just say who yeah, you are, I'm, where you're from? Yeah, I'm Steve Whittacombe. I'm uh, Director of Science at Plymouth Marine Laboratory, but also in another hat I wear is I'm the co-chair for the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, which is a network of nearly 1,000 uh, observers of ocean acidification from over 100 countries. And we're very comfortable as a group of scientists talking to each other, but we're working in regions where there's a huge amount of traditional knowledge and we're really bad at being able to bring that knowledge to bear and, and help us. So we've talked a lot about the communication of scientists, how we talk to people, but actually what I would love to hear your thoughts on and advice on, how, how does the communication go the other way? How do we delve into this amazing reservoir of knowledge to right. allow us to really Can benefit them, from like, that. That's a, that's a really interesting question. And, and Lisa, I'm sure you've got lots to say about it. Thank you so much for asking this very important question, which is one that we deal with uh, among Inuit ourselves, who, as a people, have been studied, overstudied, and have had researchers uh, um, soliciting our knowledge holders, and, and then leaving and taking, taking that knowledge and appropriating it, in fact, and pretending that it belongs to uh, 
uh, themselves. Um, so as we've had these discussions, um, we've realized that we need to guide scientists, researchers, policymakers on how to relate with us. How do we as scientists, how do you as scientists, because even I am right here with you feeling uh, alienated from your discussions. There's nothing really about the human aspect in, in the ICE discussion. And what I brought you here is we live on the ice. We depend on the ice. Our culture is part of that ice. And that's a message that's missing from the scientists. Uh, and so to be inclusive of the knowledge holders for those who know the ice and those who can speak the language of the ice, those terms that we have, we are experts of the ice. But by the way the scientists speak of ice, it's almost as if they are the only ones who know about the ice. But we know about the movements of the ice. We know that the ice is now more dangerous for us to go on. And it's um, uh, icing uh, much later in the fall and breaking up earlier in, in the spring. Um, but we have now these protocols that I would like to share with you from Inuit Circumpolar Council. It, Circumpolar Inuit protocols on ethical and equitable engagement. This is a guideline for scientists on how to communicate with us, how to engage with us, how to work with us when doing research in, in our region. Don't just come into our regions and start, you know, poking at things and, and studying and measuring and this and that. Mm -hmm. Involve the Inuit community. We live there. Yes. And we'll get along so much better if we do. And also inform the whole world and inform each other and share our knowledge. That's what the protocols are about. Thank you for asking the question. Lisa, thank you, and thank you for the question. And we've got time for one more. I'm going to go to the back, I'm afraid. Um, can we get, or do you want to come up here? Thank you. That works well, I think. Sorry, we can't get to everybody, but we're, we're, we're right in the last yeah. Thanks few so minutes. Thanks so much. Um, it was um, a wonderful session. I want to... Could you just say who you are and where um, you're from? Yeah, great. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Isa. I am representing Geo Blue Planet and as well from Tepamton University. I, during one of my fellowship in Canada, I work with the Mi'kmaq community, working on uh, the lobster fisheries. And one of the things that I would like as well to recommend is the aspect of um, two eye seeing. Two eye seeing, bringing traditional knowledge with uh, Western knowledge, having a lens of working together. It is true that the indigenous communities live, dwell, they have historic um, values along this water environment. We scientists just wake up in the morning, we go there, we go back. But however, there is, should be more of inclusiveness. Mm -hmm. Even in terms of some of the research we do, we should always find ways to include them in our publications. We should find a way so that tomorrow, the next generation will be happy that my four, four, parents, my grandparents, were part of some of this engagement. So we have this protocol during my research in Canada as a visiting um, researcher from, from Germany. Thank you so much. Great. That's, a, that's a great question. And I wonder whether, yeah, thank you very much for, for doing that. I'm wondering whether Helen, look, we're into the final kind of minute or so here of the session. Do you want to respond to that and maybe cast ahead and maybe how to take on board some of these observations? Yeah, I think it's a really good point. And I, and why I really was interested and, and hopeful that Lisa was able to join us today because I think um, we do do badly when it comes to engagement um, and something every COP that I've been to and tried to organize these events, we've tried to in include some kind of indigenous community. Um, last year we had one of the Sami leaders come and join us. And it, it's so important for us to get that perspective and try and remember that actually, like you say, it, it's, it's not just about our take on the science and it struck me just then when you were saying 
we were talking about sea ice and we have these satellite records going to 1979 and it's like this is when sea ice was first mm -hmm. observed and mm -hmm. it's like well it, it's really not they had observations and we need to get much better and it's really great to hear that people that are going to research in Canada are actually taking on board some of those um, acknowledgements and, and t trying to get papers uh, written with together with Inuit um, and Indigenous communities and I think that's something that I think we all need to take away and hopefully the future generations um, can actually be much better at um, as we kind of move on. Um, so yeah, I, I don't really have anything else to add um, to that respect, other than just to say thank you very much to all of you today for coming along. I think it's um, really nice to have this balance of science and um, community and something that struck me as you were talking is we can only fit so many people on a panel and it would have been nice to maybe think about bringing in these social scientists at, at, um, in the next sort of sessions that we have in the future, something for me to think about as we organize those in the future, particularly when it comes to this question of human impacts. And I think one of the issues we've had really is that the natural science has still been trying to make sense of what's going on. And it's only once the natural sciences kind of have a reasonable understanding, of course, there's uncertainties, that the social scientists can then say, well, what does that actually mean for the human populations and human societies? And so I think we're at that juncture now where we're much getting much better at being able to make those predictions, um, economic and socioeconomic um, aspects. And we're working together, especially in the certification world, to really go from that global view to looking at the local what does it mean for the local communities? What can we do locally to adapt and mitigate? And that all takes um, everyone's part to play in that from the scientists through to the social economists to the communities that live there. So I Great. will end there. Great, Helen, thank you. And let's applaud all our panelists, please. Great speakers, great contributions. And thank you to everybody who managed to get a question. And sorry to those who I didn't manage to get to. Hey, brilliant. Thank you very much. How wonderful. So great job. So Thank you.